Yeah. Okay, so we're ready for our first speaker on cell-based meat, and he is one of the most well-known protagonists in the field of clean meat, Dr. Mark Post from the Netherlands and CSO of Moser Meat. He is a Dutch pharmacologist and professor of vascular physiology. <laughs> Mark, you gotta help. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Such as, you know, comes in so handy sitting in right there, so physiology at Maastricht University. Um, he has served as a professor in medicine, physiology, <laughs> I'm sorry, and tissue engineering at various universities globally. He was the first in the world to present a proof of concept for cultured meat and became involved in a Dutch government funded program investigating clean meat in 2006. Mark Post is motivated by the potentially high societal impact of clean meat and continued his research even after funding had ended in 2010. In 2013, he presented the world's first hamburger cultured from bovine muscle stem cells. I could go on, but then we'd cut Mark's talk short and that'd be a shame. So please welcome on stage your first speaker of the day, Dr. Mark Post. Thank you. <laughs> <You're welcome>. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Well, thank you, good morning, and, and thanks for uh, you all being here and um, gracing us with your attention. Um, and I really also have to commend uh, ProVeg um, to organize this conference, uh, because it takes guts to, at a very early stage, um, adopt a technology that um, is very different from sort of the traditional vegetarian and vegan story, uh, but focusing on a technology that in some cases still use animals, but um, if you look at it very pragmatically, can reduce the impact on animals um, tremendously. And my personal interest is that, but also environment and food security. Um, I have been given to the task to show you a peek behind the scenes, that's literally the title. And uh, behind the scenes, this is really a very technological and scientific endeavor. So. Brace yourselves, uh, you're going to see a lot of graphs. Usually, for, when I speak for a general audience, the, there are lots of moments where you can actually relax and have uh, some fun. Not this morning, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, <laughs> so first of all, I start with a muscle, um, and which is the basis of meat, of course, and um, if you sort of break that down, the muscle is composed of smaller fibers, then even smaller fibers, um, and in the end you have basically one single muscle cell, which is, by the way, not really one single cell, it's already a merger of a large number of cells, and if you really break it down, you have these proteins here. Um, and so proteins are, to some degree, the nutritional value of meat. Um, it's the, the amino acid composition, which is very specific. Um, it has all the amino acids that we need. Um, we can do without, of course. A lot of you in this audience know that, that we can do without, but it's a product that uh, does have that nutritional value, and it does, um, it, it's appealing to a lot of people. So, when you think of the technology that are out there right now, um, I'm sure um, some of the technologies are going to focus just on these proteins, because you can make them also in a different way. Um, some are focusing on sort of the smaller, the, the, the muscle cell, the muscle fiber, some even a little bigger, and some, and you will hear examples this morning of that, not by me, but by others, some are focusing on the real tissue, to make eventually the real tissue. And eventually we all have to do that. Um, we just stage it slightly in a slightly different way. So that's kind of the background. Um, for those of you who don't really know what the technology is, I have a very brief, um, oh, by the way, yeah, so the, 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 the names for these particular technologies is slightly different and that becomes somewhat confusing. Um, for those of you who really don't understand what this technology is, it's, you know, it's pretty simple, this is a muscle cell, I said it's a merger of cells, so those blue guys are nuclei from different cells that have merged. Um, and in the 60s, people have discovered that that yellow guy is also a cell, it's very um, 
close to the muscle cell, but it's not really part of the contractile machinery. And it's called the satellite cell. And it's in 2000, uh, Michael Rutnicki described this as the stem cell of our muscle. They are sitting there waiting to repair tissue once it's injured. And once a muscle fiber is injured, they start to proliferate and they start to form muscle tissue. So it's, it's an inherent capacity of those cells. So what we do is we take a small biopsy from a cow, from the butt of a cow, where you take a very small sliver of muscle, like one centimeter long, one millimeter in diameter, that has a couple of hundred of these stem cells. And then you let the stem cells grow out. You can let them proliferate. And that is actually one of the essences of this technology, that you can amplify uh, the amount of material that you get out of a cow to hundreds, if not thousands, of kilos of meat. So the proliferation is really essential here. And again, the cells pretty much do that by themselves. But we need to help them a little bit when they are, once they are outside of the body. Then they need to merge, uh, which they, you know, the instructions to let them merge in a Petri dish are relatively simple. Um, and then they need to form a tissue. You all know that, you know, muscle becomes bulky, um, massive once it starts to exercise. Um, and for exercise, it's not only the movement. Marathon runners here, Jeroen is in the audience, he is not a particularly muscular guy. Um, so the um, the, the movement itself doesn't do it, it's the tension. Jeroen actually should go to the gym and lift weights, right? And then he becomes a muscular... Jeroen, where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> right, well, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> you're, but you're making my point very clearly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So what we do is we, uh, we uh, kind of, and, and this is, this is a, uh, an important part, we assemble those cells and we put them in a gel. I will talk about that gel later uh, because it's important. And that gel allows the cells to find each other, to hook up to each other, they align, and amazingly these cells start to contract. There's no rhyme or reason. Our muscle cells are exercise junkies. Our brains are not, but uh, these cells are not connected to a brain. So um, they start to contract, and because they're in this circle, in this ring, they want to compress that central column, which doesn't work, and so that creates tension, and that tension uh, leads to protein synthesis. So after three weeks, the muscle fibers are fine, and they look um, like on the right, this is kind of a, a, a schematic, but you, they look like an original muscle fiber. And so we harvested them, uh, we made 10,000 of these things, very tedious work, um, and we presented that hamburger, which, by the way, cost about a quarter million euro at that time. Um, so it was um, kind of a proof of concept that you can do this, technology is there, um, and by the way, we use kind of that press conference, if you like, it's a hybrid between a press conference and a cooking show, we use that to also steer up the discussion about conventional meat production and consumption. <coughs> so. What do you need to do to get from there to a, a reasonable product? So first of all, um, you, know, we want, you want to use the cow as, as little as you can. Um, and in effect, we want to reduce the herd from one and a half billion cows on this planet. I could, I could tell this story for chicken and for pigs, doesn't really matter. Um, from one and a half billion cows on this planet to, let's say, 30,000 or something. <coughs> so we want to reduce that and some of the efforts and that, again, is that replication factor of those cells. Some of the efforts are focusing on reducing the number of cows and, or coming back to the cows. Then we need to scale up production. This is a medical technology. Nobody was ever interested in scaling this. Nobody was ever interested in making it cheap. Uh, and, of course, um, a lot of the efforts now are into how can we scale this and how can we make this cheap. Then. <coughs> um, uh, Yaakov will talk about taste. Um, it needs to be a product that basically satisfies the need of 95% people for meat, right? So that's the, the essence of it. So it needs to be tasty and it needs to have the same structure, in essence, be the same. And it needs to be cheap. I will not talk about that, but there are lots of sort of calculations and movements around it to make this cheap. Um, I will not talk about consumer acceptance because Chris has a wonderful story about that and he can tell that much better than I do. I will also not talk about the regulatory aspects in the, in the EU. It's going to be a novel food, so it needs to be regulated, which I see as almost as a marketing tool to show to the public this is safe, <laughs> right? Uh, but I'm sure Jens, has, uh, as a lawyer, has a different approach to that. 
Anyway, um, he will talk about that, so I will not cover those issues also in the interest of time. So how can you make this animal free? That product that we presented in London, um, still the cells were still cultured with uh, the use of serum, which is blood, which is derived from cows, by the way. Um, and of course, you cannot do that. Um, the, the gel that we were using, the biomaterial that we were using to get those cells together was still collagen, also from cows. Um, and we used that particular um, cell in its sort of native state. <coughs> so can you grow these cells in the absence of antibiotics, which is always a, an important item? Uh, yeah, you can, and in the absence of antibiotics, you see that on the left here, guess what? You, the cells actually grow better, right? Um, which antibiotics means basically anti-life, so that makes some somewhat sense. Um, can we grow them in the absence of serum? We can, that we can do that too. Uh, there's quite some effort, a lot of effort, into making that happen at a large scale and also cheaply. Here you see uh, a very busy graph where uh, there is, this is the serum, the cells go like crazy. Um, they, they proliferate very, very fast. This is uh, day, from day one to day six. This is the number of cells. And here are a couple of commercially available serum-free media. Um, and if you read about serum-free media, you have to always realize that there are different flavors in serum-free media. Serum-free medium doesn't mean that it's completely free of animal products or doesn't mean that it's completely free of human products, right? It just means it's serum-free. So um, um, some of those have still animal products in them. Some of them have human products. This one, Essential 8, is completely chemically defined, so has none of those. And you see that the cells actually grow, but they just don't grow as fast as this one. But it's exponential growth, so if you wait two more days, they are like this. And to, to this day, we don't even know for sure whether this is actually that, that initial growth, that slow growth, is actually better or worse. We don't know. Um, we are still trying to boost that um, proliferation. Um, and here is another graph uh, that we recently obtained with three other samples. Um, this one is, again, completely chemically defined, so no animal or human components whatsoever in it. Um, and this is the growth medium, again, with the serum. So they are pretty comparable. So the advances in this field are rapid, um, which is kind of to be expected because in the medical field, uh, these serum-free media have been developed for a large range of cells, and it was kind of to be expected that at some point we would reach the same uh, level. The biomaterial that's sitting in there, the gel, <coughs> is a collagen gel. And um, what's wonderful, this is on the, on the right hand, you see a Petri dish, which I guess you can all relate to. It's a, it, it, there are, in this case, two silk wires are um, glued to the bottom of the Petri dish. And there's a collagen gel in there. And <coughs> as soon as you throw the muscle cells in it, within 24 hours, this is what, has happened, what happens. The cells organize that gel. Um, they squeeze out all the water, which is 99% of the gel anyway. They align, they form a fiber, and they start in between those two silk wires, anchor points, if you like, start to uh, contract. So the gel, it's not only like a hair gel. Um, it's, it does have a functionality. The cells need to interact with it. <coughs> And I mentioned we use collagen for it, and we don't want to use that anymore because that's an animal product. Um, and so now we are replacing that with, for instance, something like alginate. This looks already very chemical. Um, and you see here the, the, base, the base sort of uh, structure of alginate with uh, two sugars. This is a sugar gel, not a protein gel. <coughs> and um, it, it forms a gel, just like you see that on the right here nicely forms a gel, so that's not the problem. The problem, and the, and the cells like it, they don't really, and, and it's cheap, and it's readily available, and you can, you know, it, you, it's, it's already food approved, so it has all sorts of advantages, except that the cells don't really grab it, they don't really attach to it, they don't really um, squeeze out that water, and they don't form that tissue. So what we have done, which, by the way, in the biomedical field is a very standard thing, it's not something that we kind of invented, if you like, we just tried it out, is we added a small peptide, um, RGD, to the gel. And then here on the y-axis is the contraction of that gel by the cells. So it's the same as what you saw from, from that blob to a nice fiber. And you see if you add that little peptide to it, um, all of a sudden those cells are able to grab 
um, that alginate and start to squeeze out water and form a tissue just like if it were uh, collagen. <coughs> there are many other biomaterials out there that are abundant, like cellulose from trees or plants, um, silk, chitin, carrageenan from uh, seaweed. They all, um, or most of them, since they are sugar polymers, they require that little peptide, um, which we call functionalization. And then uh, recently, and maybe Neta will talk about that, uh, we can also use uh, <coughs> like more basically already ready-made plant structures as a support for uh, those cells. So then you can kind of already from the outset have a combination between a, between a plant-based and a cultured meat product. And recently, I think uh, last week came out that uh, Marianne Ellis in, at the University of Bath has succeeded in growing these cells on grass structures. Ishut, are you going to talk about that? Okay, you are, okay. So I will not cover that either. <laughs> Good. <coughs> then how about these cells? So this, the stem cells are, uh, they come in, in different flavors. Um, you have embryonic stem cells, you have uh, stem cells that can become any tissue. The cells that are in that muscle fiber can only make muscle tissue. Um, and not only that, they also have a somewhat limited proliferative capacity. Right? So at some point they peter out and you have to go back to the animal to get new stem cells, which of course we want to reduce as much as possible. So a stem cell, typically has a cycle where if it divides, it divides in two different cells. One is a stem cell that keeps on renewing the pool of stem cells, and the other is a daughter cell that becomes the muscle cell. And that one proliferates much faster than this one. So this is a very slow cycle and not very voluminous. The other cycle is, can be much faster and create many, many more cells. But at some point, it peters out. So can you actually increase the stemness of those cells? So we have uh, to, again, get more um, uh, bang out of that initial stem cell that you get from the cow so that you don't have to go back. <coughs> so there are many, many different ways. One is a, a different cell. I will talk about that later. Uh, the other is, for instance, uh, you know, the, the stem cell is defined by a molecule called PEX7, which is not really important at the moment, but it's kind of a marker for stemness. So if you, if you uh, culture the cells over a longer time, that factor goes down. Um, and if you uh, inhibit certain pathways in the cell, um, you actually s reduce that reduction in, um, in stemness. So you keep the stemness aspect of those cells over a longer time. You get more proliferation out of it um, and more meat out of one uh, sample. They're still able to differentiate um, and still able to produce meat. Now, this is a particular intervention that you actually cannot use in food, but um, you know there are many of these interventions possible and that science just continues to grow. Um, what you see increasingly now in some of the, com uh, some of the companies that are using IPS cells, Induced pluripotent stem cells, it's basically making from any body type of cell, usually a skin cell, they make a, a again, a stem cell. So they sort of reprogram it back to its original state. Um, and from those IPS cells, those, those cells have a higher proliferative capacity um, and they can differentiate in multiple different tissues. Um, <coughs> The original description of this IPS cell required genetic modification. Um, so the companies are kind of different in that. Some of them in the US are less concerned about genetic modification. We are in Europe. Uh, we are not doing genetic modification. Just a choice that we have made and some other companies have made another choice. So uh, the genetic modification includes that, that skin fibroblast, you have to put four genes in there um, that um, uh, drive this back into a stem cell. And th but there are also other modifications. Um, you can put the genes in a different format in the cell. It sounds to maybe everybody that this is also genetic modification, but this, the difference is that this gene is not integrated into the DNA of the cell. <coughs> um, would be interesting to see how regulators look at it or how the public looks at it, but there are other ways to, to produce these iPS cells. And again, the whole purpose is to make cells that actually can proliferate even, even more um, so that you can get more tissue out of it. Uh, one of the challenges there is that the differentiation from that stem cell into a muscle cell is slightly harder than from 
the muscle stem cell itself. The muscle stem cell itself kind of automatically differentiates into a muscle cell. Uh, this one you have to kind of push into that direction. And some of those pushes also require genetic modification. Uh, but there are technologies out there right now that seem to be increasing the efficiency of that differentiation so that uh, that could help. Um, efficiency is a big thing. Uh, we need to scale up. This is not a originally not a process that was designed to be scaled cell culture so um, you know we we need to do that um, the the systems are out there the machinery is out there um, but it, you need to sort of apply them to these particular muscle cells um, and the efficiency also means that you change uh, culture conditions and eventually recycle so I'll go, I'll go a little bit more quickly um, if you if you want to grow them in a tank, which is basically industrial system that we are using now for uh, large scale cell culture, you have to grow them on these little microcarriers, so on these little spheres. So the the white dots are actually the cells, and the spheres are sort of floating in that soup. Um, and we have done a lot of tests with these, and you can actually grow these cells on a microcarrier, um, in a tank, in a suspension system, and th this way you can actually uh, uh, throw, uh, uh, grow tremendous amount of cells um, in a relatively small space with relatively little uh, medium. So that is an, an, an enormous increase in efficiency. <coughs> we have also looked at can we recycle. This is something that is in the medical field not done. Uh, people don't like this idea, uh, but if we use the feed for the cells, the whole idea is to get as much out of that feed as possible and to waste as little of that feed as possible. So if you uh, feed those cells, they eventually, because they're, they're basically in their own waste, right? So they metabolize and they produce waste, like lactate and ammonium and uh, protons and things like that, and at some point they kind of drown in their own waste. So if you, um, if you want to start thinking about recycling, you have to do two things. You have to remove the waste somehow. That's why you and I have kidneys. Uh, but these cells don't have kidneys, so you know they're, <laughs> they're sitting in their own urine, basically. Um, <coughs> and, um, um, the, and you need to take care of all the ingredients that are in there, whether they, after a couple of days they are still there or whether you need to supplement them. So this is looking at the amino acids, it's just one aspect of it. Um, on the left are the essential amino acids, we have nine of them, um, and those are really essential because the, the cells need them to grow. And you see that after even after seven days, which is pretty long, um, pretty much half of all the amino acids are still there. So whatever we throw away is actually still has a lot of nutrients. <coughs> so I think recycling is going to be an important point and we're currently working on getting rid of that um, ammonium, which is the most important thing. Then mimicry, I was telling, I'm not going to talk too much about taste. Um, texture was, uh, was fine according to those tasters in, in London. Uh, color is, um, is an important thing, color from uh, Muscle cells comes from myoglobin, which is kind of a hemoglobin type of molecule, so it's red if it's exposed to oxygen. <coughs> and um, our cells, when we presented that hamburger in 2013, were yellow. So we actually stained that hamburger with uh, red beet juice, uh, organic, um, <laughs> and, um, and saffron because red beet juice is actually purple. <laughs> so yeah, we had to add saffron, and we had an um, Iranian postdoc in the lab who said, well, you know, let's use saffron for that. Um, anyway, um, so, but if you want to coerce these cells to make myoglobin, which they do by themselves, then um, uh, you need to give them specific instructions. And the instruction basically is to uh, reduce the oxygen component in uh, the environment. So if you, if you grow them under low oxygen conditions, this myoglobin production is boosted, and the cells are nicely pink, and they have the heme iron, which is also, by the way, a maybe a taste factor, but also a nutritional value. <coughs> then the fat tissue, that, um, that hamburger didn't have any fat, so it was kind of dry. Um, <coughs> so how do you create uh, fat tissue? Fat is a tissue. It's not a, it's not a blob. Well, it's a blob, but it's a blob tissue. Um, and it's also made from stem cells. Actually, in fat tissue, there are, there are specific stem cells. There are quite a lot of them. Um, and you can coerce them to become uh, fat cells. The traditional technology to do that, in the medical field, there was not a lot of incentive to make fat tissue. Um, 
But there were ways described to, to do that, and they are absolutely incompatible with food production. It requires steroids, it requires um, uh, IBMX, which is a super, super xanthin, which is toxic for people. Um, and so, you know, there are all sorts of reasons not to put that in your food. So we had to redesign that. Um, and this is a, a, a picture, where I'm pretty used to this, maybe you're not. It's a sort of looking at the biochemistry of a stem cell. So you start with a stem cell, it has all these molecules in it. Um, and this is the traditional way of stimulating that that pathway that eventually leads to adipocytes, to fat cells, um, and this is the stuff that we cannot use. So we looked at, well, what are these, what are these molecules that actually drive um, that fat cell into becoming a fat cell? It's uh, CEPB alpha, not really important, PPAR gamma, and guess what? The natural kind of compounds that drive these pathways are just fatty acids. So we can use fatty acids like linoleic acid and, and a couple of others to drive those um, uh, stem cells into fat tissue. Um, and those are food compatible, no problem. But can they actually do it? So we used a bunch of those fatty acids, every, every fatty acid that we could find in the lab, um, and throw, threw them on these, uh, these uh, stem cells. And um, some of them work, some of them don't work at all, like linoleic acid, for instance, doesn't work. It's an essential amino acid, but it doesn't work for driving um, uh, stem cells into uh, fat tissue. Uh, but for instance, prostanic acid, which is a branched uh, free fatty acid, um, actually works wonderfully well. All the red stuff here is fat. And we can make that in a tissue, add it to the muscle tissue, and then uh, sort of complement that um, hamburger, if you wish. Um, this is one of my favorite um, uh, publications out there. It's from a Japanese group um, who actually have combined that alginate idea that I put forward for uh, making the gel for that uh, muscle tissue. Uh, that alginate idea, it's kind of complex. It's here, the alginate with um, stem cells. Um, they are in this kind of system. Then you add calcium to it so that it becomes a gel. And then you get these spaghettis basically spaghettis with fat cells in them. And if you do it right, uh, these fat cells become really, really like true fat cells. And then you have in your Petri dish spaghettis of fat cells that you can kind of cut and mix with your uh, muscle tissue. Um, <coughs> I said that I was not going to talk about complete tissues with all the, with a full thickness, like a ribeye type of thing. Uh, I would love to do that, but um, uh, Neta is going to talk about that. They uh, are kind of jumping uh, to the next st step, which I commend them for it. Uh, it's going to, it's, it's challenging, but um, eventually it's absolutely necessary. So I'm not going to talk about it. I think Neta will uh, probably cover what is required to go from essentially what is very small type of muscle fibers to a larger uh, tissue. So what I've been trying to do in, in the last uh, sort of half hour is to show you that this is not an easy process. This is highly technological. Uh, there are m different steps to come eventually to a success. There are lots of hurdles. None of the hurdles are insurmountable. None of them are, at least I cannot see it. None of them are in insurmountable. There are just, just a bunch of them. Um, <coughs> and so um, I see it as a sort of a, a, a hurdle uh, race. Uh, you know, we have to go hurdle by hurdle, some of them at the same time, some of them kind of sequentially. Um, but if we put enough effort in this, then uh, this is going to happen. Of course, we know the technology is there. With happening, I mean going to be at large scale um, at a sort of a commercial uh, proposition so that people can actually buy this at large scale and it becomes a commodity. Because we are all in this to solve a problem, not to, to solve a problem of conventional meat production, not to, because we just like, well, we also like the technology and the science, of course, that uh, um, we like that too, but um, we really want to solve a problem. So none of these hurdles are insurmountable. they are just quite a lot of them. Um, and that's why I'm really happy that um, you know, since three years, 
we are no longer the only ones doing this. There are now like 30, 35 companies uh, doing the same thing. There are lots of academic groups um, eventually getting that this is what we should be doing. Um, and uh, that sort of increases the chance that, that sooner rather than later, all the different steps, all the different solutions to these problems will uh, become a reality and we will eventually, uh, maybe in a couple of years, um, see this coming to our tables. So with that, I would like to thank you and I'm happy to entertain questions or comments. Thank you, Mark. So, do we have any questions on this update on cell-based meat? Any questions to Mark oh. from the audience? You oh, see someone? Question. Okay, I'm come, <laughs> come over there. I'm gonna hold the mic for you. You wanna stand yeah. up? Okay. Cor van der Weele, Wageningen University. Thank you for this overview. Um, uh, my question um, uh, is about the very end of what you were saying about all these companies now working on cultured meat or clean meat or what to call it. Um, cultured meat. Cultured meat. Okay. <laughs> um, I, had, I had to say that. <laughs> to what extent do these companies collaborate and, and, and learn from each other? That's, that's all I, uh, that's the question. <laughs> yeah, what a mean question. Um, <laughs> Uh, th these, these companies are all, um, are all led by um, idealists. Um, and you would think that they would um, sort of share all their information to uh, sort of get there sooner. <coughs> um, that's, that happened in the beginning. Uh, it's still happening to some degree, uh, not probably as much as would be sort of efficient. Um, because one of, my, one of the big frustrations that I have um, and I've expressed this many times, is that this endeavor is hardly publicly funded. Um, so uh, fortunately, it's privately funded, but the private funding comes with, uh, you know, the request of investors to get return of their investment, um, and therefore you need to kind of protect your uh, sort of unique selling point, if you like. I kind of sound like a businessman. Um, <laughs> <coughs> but um, that's just the reality of it. Um, so we try to avoid that as much as we can. We do uh, talk to each other a lot, um, also on issues that are really not commercially interesting, like the regulatory aspects of it. Um, GFI is doing a fair job in getting those companies aligned on a number of issues. They also provide resources for uh, the companies. So there is some level of collaboration, uh, but it probably if there were more, it would actually go faster. Okay, um, do we have any other question to Mark? There is one back there <laughs> coming. Just gonna hold this for you. Uh, Frank Cordesmeyer from Bula Group. Thanks a lot for the great presentation, Mark. Uh, you spoke about the significance of upcycling media and that there's still functional nutrients in the media. Um, what's the approach towards upcycling this and how feasible is it to um, get all the ammonia out of the nutrient media? Right. Um, well, there, there are um, a couple of different technologies to get the ammonium out, uh, which is basically filtration and, um, and sort of exchange with other um, components on the filter. Um, so we're currently working on that. Uh, we haven't really decided which one is sort of the most efficient yet. Um, the, uh, and, and of course, the other part, which is much simpler, is actually supplementing, analyzing which amino acids need to be supplemented and then basically supplement them in line, right? Um, what we do know is that the, the lactate, uh, we have done spiking experiments where we looked at ammonium levels, which ones are actually acceptable, um, and pH levels, which are acceptable, and, and lactate levels. Uh, lactate is pretty inconsequential to the health of the cells, the, uh, the ammonium is. Um, so we're currently focusing on uh, especially extracting the ammonium. Um, and yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, a, at this stage, it's a combination of a filtration with, an with a chemical compound on that filter to capture the uh, ammonium. Oh, we got, I don't know if we have more time for questions. It's actually, so maybe we take one question and that's it. Sorry, yeah, it's, now I have to decide. Mark, do you want to pick someone? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sorry, you were an imposter here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael from Huntmann. Thanks for these interesting insights. My question is uh, a little bit more basic. Yesterday, we've learned a lot about uh, the plant-based meat. And uh, wouldn't you expect that the better the plant-based meat gets, the less is the need for a cell cellular-based meat? So that I there is a competitive aspect. You were talking about pricing. And uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's my question, if, if you wouldn't uh, expect these competitive aspects. Right. Um, I do. And um, um, I'm, I'm actually really embracing that uh, competition. So I, uh, together with, uh, you know, I, I guess all the people here, I see that there are different solutions for a similar problem that we have identified with conventional meat production. There are similar solutions. Um, I'm, I cannot predict which one is going to get all the favors of the consumers in the future. So I think it's safe to bet on all of them. Um, and eventually, I think this is a, a response that the consumer should make, right? Um, but at the same time, I, th I feel, and there are many people with me who feel the same, that betting on the plant-based getting better and better and better to a degree, to, a, to a, uh, an extent that they can satisfy the craving for meat of 95% of the people is a, a risky bet. So I think we should bet on different horses to get there and eventually 10, 30, 40 years from now let the consumer decide uh, what their preference is. I also do think, and I've expressed that a couple of times, um, I didn't go into it right now if I have one <laughs> half minute. <laughs> you do. How can you say no to that? That, um, you know, meat is also a cultural thing. It's power, it's supremacy over another species. It's, uh, you know, it's much more than just the food. Um, and if you start making this in the lab, it becomes something else. It becomes like the wimpy version of meat, right? Um, and it may lose some of its attractiveness and it may be slightly nudge people into, well, you know, if it's so wimpy anyway, I, I might as well eat peas. Right? So I think this could be a transitional product that actually facilitates the route towards a more plant-based diet. I know it's kind of a revolutionary thought, but I, I, I do think that that's what is the, the, truly the case. It's more like broccoli, basically. That's what we are here for, revolutionary <laughs> thoughts, right? <laughs> cool, okay. So, yes, uh, maybe another round of applause Thank for you. Mark Kors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Conclude with that. And, and with that, I'll hand it over to Jeroen.